kabinet berpendapat bahawa ini tidak mencerminkan keadilan dan timbang rasa oleh agama Islam. Xin chào or hello in Vietnam. Selamat datang. This is a special session at the arena at the World Comic Forum ASEAN 2018 right here in Hanoi, Vietnam. This is also being telecast over web and over television around the world through WEF but also through the Astro Awani multiple platforms. I would like to welcome you to this discussion by explaining that first particular video. This is a passionate discussion for me because as an ASEAN citizen, the core of being any ASEAN citizen for me is we are very, very mixed and plural and diversified in our DNA, our food, or everything else around us. The video you just saw highlighted at the end the best for me of pluralism as exemplified on May 9 in Malaysia Diversity in majority unison, ushering in new hope through the ballot box without harm, injuries or death. The oldest politician that you saw just now, our new Prime Minister, leading a diversified force in his second coming at SPM at 93. His former protégé turned his number one opponent before, whom he jailed, is now his coalition partner that is the chosen successor. And he, Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim was dancing on stage with a, an MGR from the Tamil movies Lookalike and it was a Tamil song and he could speak Tamil. That's how diverse my new leaders are. Um, but is this just a sliver of hope in the increasingly creeping darkness of threats to diversity and pluralism in Southeast Asia? We are the most diverse region and population maker of the world, but religious fault lines leading to extremism and terrorism is creeping in. Racial divides burning acceptance and tolerance before into now hate and violence. Economic monopoly shredding trust between people, businesses and government. From the gubernatorial elections of Jakarta, the Al-Ma'idah from the Quran issue with Ahok, to the Rohingyas well highlighted, but not really well dealt with. Continuing tragedy that's still happening. To the streets demonstrations, because the new ride sharing makes a lot of drivers who plow the streets for their income is now gone. And the taxi drivers are not alone in that. Diversity is definitely and really has been ASEAN strength, but is it really slipping away? Five key leaders of this region and beyond will be discussing this with us today. The first on my right is a very passionate and impressive political leader of Indonesia, Grace Natalie. From a journalist and TV presenter, that's me. That's the new super version that you can be. She co-founded Parti Solidir uh, Partai Solidaritas Indonesia. I always mix my Indonesians. But it's uh, the Solidarity Party of Indonesia. And I've never met with this kind of party anywhere around the world. It looks at women and youth issues. It's made up majority of young people from the age of late teens until maybe 25. Uh, those are the key group that the party looks at. So, Natalie, I'm glad you are here, but I'm also glad that you are sitting beside an artist because we don't just want this to be a hard, serious talk. We need arts into the picture. So, please welcome also Miguel. Miguel is a very interesting guy. And uh, Miguel Sihuko, he said it's not Sijuko, J is H, because his ancestral line goes all the way back to mainland China. But he's a Filipino. He's an assistant professor. I shall not give you the full title because it's so long and diversified, <laughs> but safe to say he's an assistant professor in NYU Abu Dhabi. Sitting straight across from me, I always put the capitalist right in front of my eyes. Uh, <laughs> cannot come bigger than the Lipo group. 
John Riyadi have met before in Davos, family face and name in ASEAN and of course in Davos, and the Lipo Group and the Riyadi family, very established business family and conglomerate of Indonesia. Uh, John now is the executive director of the Lipo Group. From you know, one important ASEAN island nation to an island way up north in Asia, Japan. But uh, if the discussion today gets too heated, we have the Reverend. <laughs> because um, Reverend Sujino will be the one to include uh, the aspects of interfaith or interreligious discussions, networking, and problem solving. Because through his uh, designation and RFP, Deputy Secretary General, he empowers more than 90 countries' discussion on this matter and networking. Last but not least, don't be fooled. I saw uh, Miguel's uh, tweet, but uh, Emily Pradichit is not from Thailand, actually. I thought so too, but she's actually born, she was born in Paris, in France, but uh, two parents who migrated uh, to France because of the happenings in Southeast Asia in Laos. And uh, <coughs> she, she co-founded uh, a very important foundation, and she's going to talk and, and represent the marginalized societies, especially of Southeast Asia. So um, this is not going to be the forum format. I'm just going to go straight to it. When it comes to food, Roja is my favorite. I think the Indonesians know that well, too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there, you know, uh, fruits or otherwise. When it comes to football, it's not just the French, I'm back my pardon, uh, Emily, that won the World Cup with people not just looking white. Because if I look at the Indonesian football team, it's multiracial. The Malaysian football team is likewise. But when it comes to competitive wealth aggregation, inequalities, when it comes to the political platform, when it comes to the power of the government to the people, then suddenly we have issues of pluralism. Why? Are we Jekyll and Hyde in Southeast Asia? So I would like to start with you, because you are actually a European disguised as a Southeast Asia. Can you give your views? Because you left Europe to fight for these kind of causes in Southeast Asia. I think you pointed out very clearly what you are talking about is actually hypocrisy. You know, when we have the French team comprised mainly of uh, players who are from African descent and also teams in Indonesia and Malaysia who are multiracials, everybody is happy to win and then we form one country and there's unity and everybody is celebrating it. But when it comes to tackling social justice and talking about inequalities, that's when governments become more hypocrite. So I would say government in, in Southeast Asia so this, this ASEAN region is very rich when it comes to capital, but it's a region that is very poor when it comes to respecting human rights. Okay. And that's a very, very uh, important uh, focus of uh, Manushaya Foundation. Emily, I love you, but I want to speed it up a okay. little. Just go straight to the point. How come two of my original panelists cannot get to come into this panel today because they were not allowed into the country, but Do Aung San Suu Kyi is? And we still baffled why we can't stop the atrocities to the Rohingyas. It's simply because Southeast Asian countries do not want people to tell the truth. And that's a real hypocrisy. ASEAN governments will make international commitments at the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council. They would say that they are committed to implementing and respecting human rights. But when it comes to addressing the Rohingya crisis and putting words to what is a reality, it's a genocide, uh, they don't want to hear about it. And they don't want human rights activists and human rights defenders to actually talk about it. So that's why they are using criminal laws or they are banning people from entering the country, such as the bestowed heart from a uh, secretary general of FIDH who could not come to Vietnam, who was banned from entering Vietnam because of her activism and because she's speaking out and speaking for marginalized communities. We try to right wrongs where we can. Gender diversity rule runs here. I'm biased for the gender group here. So, Grace Natalie, please tell us your views on that because before you were like me, you have to be in the middle, mm -hmm. journalist ethics and all that. But now you're leading a party and you might have to choose sides, build coalition, but the older powers, the preset establishment, are they using the faults of fault lines of the multiracial composition, multi-religious and lingual for their own advantage? Because at the end of the day, it's about power. Okay, thank you, Kamarul. Always a pleasure to sit by, by sit by, side by side with yes. a fellow journalist. 
And um, I'm in politics for uh, almost four years now. And uh, we were there to witness uh, our former governor, Pahok, was um, uh, trialed for a blasphemy and has to spend two years in, in prison. And it's going to be uh, released, I think, maybe around December or January. So Indonesia, no doubt, is the land of diversity. We have substantial uh, religion and faith and and so far we live in harmony and we we uh, received the title of being tolerant and but what happened just um a year ago with hulk <coughs> make us questioned have us have we lost our tolerance have mm -hmm. we changed it's another form of society well there's this survey uh, a polling made by uh, saiful mujani research and consulting it's a credible uh, research organization in Indonesia, they found that uh, they asked the uh, correspondents um, which group of people they dislike the most. The top three are um, LGBT okay. and ISIS and also communist, while the dislike towards the Chinese and Christian are very, very low. In fact, the, the survey uh, was conducted uh, somewhere end of 2016, and um, the, the dislike towards the Chinese only 0.8%, and this has been consistent for at least 15 years. So the narration, the narratives that is built now, the hatred towards the Chinese communities and also the Christian are not actually uh, in line with the findings through the survey. But we do see an uh, increasing number of intolerance. And um, what happened to Pahok, based on this survey, so it's solid that actually the public has no dislike to the Chinese, so it's not about ethnicity, mm -hmm. not about uh, having a, you know, being minority in faith, but in my point of view, it was fabricated for political interest. By political interest. By political interest. After Pahok was sentenced to years of prison, the police revealed that there was a, a syndicate that produced hoax and fake news, and they were actively producing fake news during the Jakarta uh, gubernatorial election. So. We see political um, exploitation. They exploit the, the religion issue, the ethnicity issue for their own interests. So it's not only about you know, the, the society uh, being intolerant. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, um, the, the youth are showing tendency to become more xenophobic and intolerant, but, there is, but that is not the main issue. Right. So in that case, the preset established political powers being the last to migrate to the new converged reality of the fourth industrial revolution because they want to maintain their base of power so they use the tools that they know best which is to divide and uh, you are my great friend today because that's the political side but we have to talk business here you know this is the world economic forum <coughs> so i want to ask you this you know uh, Ethnicity matters, and if you're a minority, people tend to think, especially from the West, that you'll be marginalized right here in Southeast Asia. But your family has built a very successful business platform and also uh, reaching out to a lot of people in Indonesia and beyond. So I would like your take on what Grace Natalie has said. Let me say a few things. First of all, I want to echo uh, the optimism that Grace shares. The outcomes of the Jakarta uh, gubernatorial elections where our Chinese Christian governor lost. Think about it. In a city of Jakarta where there are only, where only 13% of the constituents or the voters are either Christians and or Chinese, Ahok, a Christian and Chinese governor with all his divisive actions mm -hmm. still won 42% of the votes. Okay still won 42% of the votes, despite the whole city only having 13% of the people that are either Christians or Chinese. So that suggests that despite all the things that he's done that he's, that's highly controversial, a, a substantial number of non-Christians, non-Chinese, still voted for him. 
So I think, if, if anything, I look at the outcomes of the Jakarta elections as a sign that pluralism is very much alive in Indonesia. We also look at someone like Grace, a minority in more than three or four ways. She's able to do the things that she does, able to build a political party okay. from scratch, from the ground. I think, again, is evidence that, that pluralism is very much alive. Point taken, but how do you look at it from the business community and perspective? Because whatever happens politically, you want business to continue. A lot of investment done. And I think the good thing about Indonesia is business is separate from, from uh, identity politics. And I think this may be a, a different path that, you know, if you take a look at Malaysia and Indonesia going back 30 years ago, mm -hmm. both countries face some of the same racial, religious challenges. But I think both countries, each country took on vastly different approaches to dealing with those issues. Indonesia took on a much more anti-classification strategy, whereas Malaysia took on a much more affirmative action policy. Yeah. In Indonesia, your race or religion has no bearing on business. There are no requirements that says to do A or B, you must be a certain race or religion. So I think, to be honest, um, I very rarely or never wake up uh, and think about my business in the context of my race or, or, or religion. I think I'm, it's, it's, it's a very pluralistic country that, that we live in in Indonesia. Reverend Sujino, you had a big role to play in the Yogyakarta statement, uh, you know, about interface and interreligious. How is it that I get that kind of optimism from John and from Grace Natalie? But uh, when I look at what happened in Sulawesi, when I look at the lynching of a few people just because they believe that's the word from the kitab, uh, or the religious book that they're professing. I mean, how could we go from there, that kind of optimism, to suddenly turn around and say, you're not my friend anymore because I'm standing here. This is about me and God. I'm going to heaven, for example. How do you reconcile these multi-religious aspects? Thank you so much. Uh, just, uh, you mentioned the Myanmar situation, and I would like to mention the speed of uh, in, uh, the impact of uh, fourth uh, industrial revolution yes. on the speed of the spread of social hostility. So what's happening in Rakhine State then spread uh, across the country in Myanmar and affected Buddhist-Muslim relations. And then ASEAN as a whole, uh, uh, I think 250 million Muslims, 205 million Buddhists, so 42, 40, 40 percent respectively, so that the relationship between Muslim and Buddhist in ASEAN states have been affected. So that's the speed and of the spread of social hostility. And in how to address that, uh, really, I, I have very, very positive uh, understanding of the role of religion. religion religious communities can play an uh, important role. Uh, what happened in Yogyakarta was convening senior most religious leaders from the region, uh, Muslim and Buddhist, and revisited the scriptures, original scriptures, uh, Quran, Quranic scriptures, Buddhist scriptures, and came up with the shared values and commitments. And that uh, normative statement on the shared value can become the basis for multi-religious, multi-ethnic vision for peace and development. So that uh, practice has to continue that the politics and religion, that uh, uh, the ex exploitation of re religion in politics will continue, unfortunately. Okay. But we have to be resilient and try to advance the vision of multi... Can that win over the big amount of funding and money going to political campaigns and rallies? They're going to have their presidential election next year. What hope is there for civil society, NGOs and the likes that want the positive change? against these powerful forces? That you, you can't overlook these powerful political forces behind everything, but uh, it's important to create sustainable mechanism for resistance, uh, with the resilience and the yeah. social cohesion building. Okay. One example in Indonesia. And you and Muhammadiyah are associated with different political parties, mm -hmm. but there is an attempt to create inter-religious council where uh, NU representatives, Muhammadiyah representatives, uh, Buddhist association, Hindu association, so all different communities coming together to create this mechanism to address tensions, uh, uh, overcome uh, the, the challenges. 
So that kind of habit of collaboration and dialogue has to be cultivated. Emily, help me here. People used to think that, you know, if you take religion as one of the diversity aspects that we want to look at, oh, you know, the terrorists come from some village somewhere, didn't go to school, doesn't have any money, so it's easier for them to subscribe to this. But uh, you were born in Bonlieu. I, I, ho I hope my French is correct there. Mm -hmm. You know, the suburbs, you know, the squatters areas where even the most civilized, advanced societies of Europe still marginalize people who they supposed mm -hmm. to preach the right ideas. You talk about hypocrisy, but what hope is there? Because you've seen even in Europe where there are more mechanisms to help the marginalized, marginalization is still happening. So what chance is there for ASEAN if even in the more advanced Europe is like that? It's like that in Europe because human rights, people th tend to think that human rights are being uh, are a Western ideology. And I was born and raised in France, which is the country of human rights, you know. Uh, but there's this invisible glass of, there's this invisible glass of inequality that people cannot advance, that it's very difficult if you're coming from a minority or if you were, even though you were born in France, to be able to advance. I think the, the hope that we might have for ASEAN is that there, there is this shared value within uh, ASEAN communities and ASEAN countries that we support each other, that communities support each other, these shared values of love and compassion. ASEAN countries are less selfish than Western countries and people tend to share more. Now the issue is when we are looking at Southeast Asian countries and our, our panelists, my, my fellow panelists were very positive. I also have lots of positivity and hope okay. only if you listen to marginalized communities, only if you listen to LGBTI, if you listen to migrant workers, refugees, stateless people, indigenous communities, those that are being affected by criminal laws, those by, that are being affected by businesses that are operating without taking into consideration whether it is respecting the livelihood and the land of the people that are living in the, in the place where businesses are being built. Unless we listen to them and we empower marginalized communities to be at the center of the solution, I don't see hope. I see hope only if you empower the most marginalized to be, to be able to sit at the same table as decision makers. Miguel, you're gonna to have to help us here because in January in Freezing Davos, the co-author of uh, Professor Schwab's book, when I interviewed him, Nicholas, he said, if you don't talk about it, you don't see it, if you don't see it, you don't have it, mm -hmm. right? when talking about the effects of uh, for, for IR. But uh, if it's in our literature to promote more positivity, but good news doesn't travel as fast as bad news. Well, literature is really just part of a big conversation, as is media and as is a, a, an event like this. Um, Grace mentioned narrative and how narrative is used uh, to divide and, and conquer within different communities. Um, but what's interesting is is really how, how being able to speak out freely, you know, being able to have a voice is, is being able to have a vote within society. Okay. And I, I think it would be helpful for us to really uh, question and, or interrogate this idea of what, what is pluralism? Okay. Uh, we, what is it really, for you? Well, to me, it's, it's an idea or an ideal, and since it's an ideal, therefore it's a goal, in, in which it's a, it's a very revolutionary goal, in which all sectors of society have equal access to power and representation so that they can advocate for their own rights and needs. Uh, it's incredibly simple. And you know, the title of this event is Pluralism Under Threat in Asia. And I, I find it a very silly question because it's, I believe that it's, it's, it is absolutely under threat. I think the real question is, do people care? Are they willing to sell out their rights for economic gain, um, for partisan politics. Um, and I, I think also we have to take from business. Ec um, economics is based on competition, and competition is seen as a good thing. And yet in terms of, in the realm of ideas, in, in, the, ter in the realm of discourse uh, and political values, it seems increasingly, uh, in this region particularly, and around the world that the competition within ideas is, is, is becoming uh, increasingly attacked uh, and people, especially the powers that be, are more willing to seek a monopoly of these ideas. I want to go there, I want to yeah. go to monopoly. Monopoly by strong political power, a big entrenched vested political interest, 
plus in business, big, I'm not, my hand doesn't go there, John, uh, <laughs> big businesses and conglomerates. So, well, exactly. I mean, in business monopoly, we will, we will, we will um, shout and, and, and protest that a business is becoming a monopoly. Lay on top, we won't do the that in politics. Under President Duterte. What about him? Your views on that? Because people were hoping for so much change, just like in the United States of America. But now, suddenly, it looks different. Uh, I, I will keep my views on Duterte to myself. I don't think this is the, 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 the venue for that, uh, and in fairness to, to our discussion. Uh, I, what, one thing I will say about uh, President Duterte's tenure is that nowhere have I, no, in no time in my lifetime, I'm 42 years old, in no time have I seen Filipinos so divided, but at the same time, never have I seen Filipinos so politically engaged. And I see that as a, as a great disruptive opportunity. Um, I do have issues with uh, Mr. Duterte's particular brand of politics, um, but I'm hoping that in this disruption that he represents, Filipinos will become more politically engaged. Uh, we, we certainly are already enraged, um, but I, 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 I see things as getting worse before they get better. Politics run in your family. If I were to believe your Twitter timeline, your father, yes. right? Yes. If uh, Mindanao issues and the moral issue is not solved, then how do you look at it? In what regard? In, you know, peace and finally development shared equally across the whole islands. Thailand has the South Thailand, for example. Myanmar has Rohingya. Malaysia has the Borneo side that is not equal in development. Oh, that, it's, it's very exciting that we have the first Mindanaoan president. It really is. Uh, finally, hopefully, we'll see opportunities opening up for that region in the south. He, he is seen as a, as, uh, a hopeful peacemaker. Um, but at the same time, there is the drug war. At the same time, there is this division amongst all of these other okay. sectors of society. And I, I'm not so much worried about what will ha what happen during the Duterte regime. I'm, I'm more worried about what we'll see t in our democracy afterwards. We're Asia's oldest democracy, but we've always been a dictatorship of dynasties. Okay. Where, uh, a majority of, of our elected positions are right. dynasties. And so how can we actually have a, a proper democratic uh, society? How can, I mean, our constitution is built so that if I or anyone, any Filipino wanted to run for office, we should be able to. Yes. But the reality is that we're not able to do that. Okay. And so although Mindanao is now being better represented, the, the real question is, Equally across the nation, are other people being well represented and given the opportunity to, to seek power? Since the beginning of the Share discussion. Share power, I should say, not yeah. seek power. Too many people are seeking power. Take your point. Since the beginning of the discussion, whatever, whichever point we went to, seems to allude back to one of the key pillars marked in the website of WEF or WEF that is, new kind of leadership might be needed to oversee ASEAN not only surviving the fourth industrial revolution, but championing it our way. So I want to ask one key takeaway in that respect, from that viewpoint of each of you on pluralism in ASEAN and the new kind of leadership, because I keep hearing big businesses, big political power and entities. So because I started from my right hand side, I'm going to start with you, Emily. We do need a new leadership. We need women to be more empowered, we need, we need women in power in ASEAN, and we need to move from patriarchal society to society that's actually embraced women leadership and youth leadership. Youth, and especially youth from marginalized communities have so much to offer, women have so much to offer. We are very diverse, we are smart people, young people are very smart, very creative, and I think it's time for ASEAN to build their own leaders and stop looking at Western leaders. There's so much potential in ASEAN, and it's time for women leadership to, to take place. Reverend? Yes, uh, I think um, playing on fear to create identity is wrong. And uh, nurturing and creating the multi-religious and multi-ethnic uh, vision for peace and development is critical. Okay. And that's the identity of ASEAN. And uh, leadership can come from political arena, religious leaders, youth leaders, grassroots community leaders, but we have to keep cultivating that the important identity, multi-religious, multi-ethnic identity, uh, vision for peace. Just a follow-up to that point. 
do we ban stuff like political parties naming themselves after religions like Islamic party or Christianity party? Because in Southeast Asia, we're too diversified for that. Some people think. What do you think? I think the, the politics and religion, um, the inseparable. So, uh, so there are many things. Uh, the, uh, polit uh, the different identities, different mandates, and different capacities between politics and religion. We have to acknowledge that. And there will be some misuse, exploitation of religion, or religions allow us, uh, themselves to be instrumentalized by politics. Those phenomena will continue. But as I said, the, this uh, uh, persistence on the vision uh, of multi-religious vision for peace is critical. John, are we too set in our ways for wealth creation or societal well-being, mobility moving outwards? Diversity has always been the strength of ASEAN. And in some ways, pluralism has always been under threat. But I take a very optimistic view that I think the changes going on in ASEAN today, and in particular the fourth industrial revolution, will bring great benefits to the, to the continuing resilience of our diversity. You take a look at some of the best things that, that has happened in our region recently, whether it's the election of our current governor, Jokowi, our current president, Jokowi, or the many inventions brought about by the many disruptive companies in Indonesia today, those are all made possible by the fourth industrial revolution. And I think those are all having a positive impact on pluralism. So I, I think more good is to come. Just to be devil's advocate, the thousands of taxi drivers on the streets of Jakarta, I could still see it. Thousands of taxi drivers lost their jobs, and millions of drivers New now job. earn more income because of these ride-hailing companies. So, so I, I, I still uh, maintain my position that I believe that disruption brings positive impact to society. Miguel, new leadership needed? Absolutely. You know, it, we were talking here about politics and religion, two things that we're not supposed to talk about in a polite really? dinner. Um, but I absolutely believe we should be talking about this more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, discourse is always good, um, civil discourse particularly. And you know, I'm, I'm a writer, so my job is to imagine the culture, the society that we can have one day, the world uh, that, uh, as it could be. But at the same time, I am also supposed to examine, listen, and understand the world as it is. And I, I think everybody here in this room will agree that the world is as it shouldn't be. A lot of things need fixing. And we definitely need new leadership. It, it, it's incredible that in the Philippines, the median age is 23. Um, I, I think the numbers in, uh, across ASEAN, it's 60% it's, uh, are yes. under 35. Um, and yet our leaders are all in their 70s or you know, set in their old ways. Um, and in, it's, it's funny in this social media age, it's followers and influencers. We, don't, we, don't long, we, we see ourselves as followers. And I think we need to have that paradigm shift where we, we actually begin to see ourselves as leaders. Yeah. Um, the, the fact of the matter is everybody in this room is a leader in one way or another, whether it's of your family, yes. your corporation, your, company, your small business, uh, your church group, your community. And if we were able to see ourselves as leaders participating within society, then we will no longer fall victim to the narrative that the powers that be pedal towards us and say, well, we will be the protagonists here, support us, and we will fix everything. The truth is, politics is far too important to leave to the politicians. And we all need to participate, and we all need to take some sort of leadership role in that way. Okay, cool. Um, Ibu Grace Natale. Yeah. Um, um, I totally agree with John that uh, Asian pluralism is alive and kicking, but we have to acknowledge that the threat is there and it's growing in numbers and we have to do something about it. And one way to, to do it is um, to go into politics or to support the moderates to go into politics. Okay. What happened um, in Indonesia just a few months ago is that um, there's this, uh, this uh, lady who was complaining about uh, the sound of, of Azan yeah. and she was uh, trialed for blasphemy and she was sentenced uh, one and a half years in prison. Well, after she, she complained, 
there was um, uh, some people who burned temples, and for them, the, 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 the sentence was only one or two months in prison. And we see that no parties, including the Nationalist Party, say or have a position in this case. The judge was definitely under pressure. So we need to, to, to jump in this scene. Yeah. Politics, one of the way. Mm -hmm. My party, PSI, even though we're not in the parliament, but we visited her in prison just last week, and we committed that we will uh, take part in her plea uh, to the next level of, uh, of the, the court. Um, so we, we, this is how we fight intolerance. Okay. And we have to do it systematically. Otherwise, I'm afraid that the, the pluralism in Asian might, um, I'm not gonna say gone. Go down the hill. Yeah, but you know, if, if, if it's already tough now, if you just let it be, it will, it will get tougher and tougher. So I, I will uh, support anybody who, who wants to fight for pluralism. One way to do it is to fight through to, to political channel. Yeah. You know, to pass the law that is fair for everybody mm -hmm. from all ethnicity mm -hmm. and from all uh, religion or faith. Uh, we have increasing numbers of uh, local laws that is getting getting more and more um, not supportive to pluralism. Like in Aceh, okay. uh, there's this uh, law who forbid those who are not buying in marriage to sit in the same coffee table and drink coffee together. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is happening in real. So definitely we have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And one way to do it is to go into politics. Okay. Point taken, don't just <laughs> gossip about the leaders yeah. in coffee shops. Go in and do something. That's what you have done. By the way, so who's the best president for next year for Indonesia? Never mind, not the forum. <laughs> I can say it. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. This is diversity in action. Please include more diverse views. I'm going to use my moder moderator's right. Tan Sri Modern Majid will be the first question from Malaysia. Tan Sri, please indulge me. I need your views on this because I've shown the clips about the Tun Mahathir's comment on the caning of the supposed two LGBT-based uh, victims. Anyone else, please raise your hand as usual, introduce your name and where you come from, and then put your question out. If we can get the first mic to Tan Sri Mune. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think the Malaysian general election that uh, resulted in the famous victory of the opposition uh, was a plus. We're talking about plurality, it's a plus. And Mahadi's uh, cabinet was an immaculate conception. It had the mix of race, it had the mix of gender, it had the mix of, uh, in fact, Mahadi is the young, oldest prime minister in the world. We also have the youngest minister in the world in a cabinet, for example. And, and, and mix of, of gender, race, uh, and age, you know? Yeah. And so it was, it was, it was a great thing. Uh, and however Malaysia still faces this problem, the, at the wave of the wand, you can't immediately change the nature of the society, but it's a beginning of a change. So we, you've been talking about the need for change. I mean, what would you think are the catalysts for change, you know? Winning in a political uh, election, a campaign, uh, bringing about uh, change uh, in society, their thinking. Like in Malaysia, I feel we have to assault. We have to begin to attack the Malay Muslim mentality, have a mass movement to attack it, not to, to you know, violently, but to attack it through okay. the mind and, and through argument to actually bring it down. You know, bring, bring, bring it, lower it, and say, you know, the Malays are not under threat. Okay. Muslims are not under threat. Cool. 150 billion ringgit, which is about 40 billion US dollars, had been spent on the Malays these past years. It's been a Malay government which has been in power for 61 years. Okay. How come you'll be under threat? 
You didn't use your opportunities. You have to begin to, to attack them. If you are Muslim, why are you so insecure? Point taken, Tansri. I would like to go past the immigration yeah. uh, so, 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 what is a catalyst? What yeah. is a catalyst? What is the catalyst? I'll take one more question. <laughs> please, anyone? Would you like to ask, please? I would like for it to be gender diverse. Yes, thank you so much. I'll buy you coffee after this. I'll hold you to that. Yes. Hi, I'm Maui. I'm an impact investor from the Philippines. I just wanted to ask everyone on the panel, uh, be, uh, keying into Miguel's point on narrative, I think everybody has, um, democracy is, is essentially a, a self-perpetuating system where every voice should be heard. Um, and I think that the, the concept of ASEAN pluralism is one song, many voices. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's natural for human beings right. to listen to other narratives. Okay. And I think the reason we're losing to narrow nationalism is that pluralism doesn't have a great brand, doesn't have a great narrative. Mm -hmm. Right, and how I was wondering how in each of their diverse fields in business and in politics and in um, religion, how we can make that okay. a chorus. Very good point made. And uh, who would like to start? I, I think it's, I mean, in, in the spirit of what I'm going to say, I think uh, it, it's a question of not being silent. Uh, that, that is the catalyst, uh, the, the sense that we are being silenced in, within certain sectors of society and a refusal to be silenced by the powers that be who are seeking to control that narrative, to use it for their divisive purposes to, to maintain power. And they'll use religion, they'll use economics, um, they'll use ideas, they'll, they'll use anything they can to quash any dissenting voices. In the Philippines, we, we have media that, 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 that is under attack. We have opposition uh, leaders who are being arrested or, or trying to be arrested, these are efforts, quite simply, to shut them up because their ideas are competitive ideas to the status quo. Okay. And um, I believe the catalyst will just be eventually enough is enough. We'll start feeling enough. John, I enough. want to moderate the question a bit. It's easier to go against and the government, the political powers paint them as black. But um, the more invisible one or underground is the business monopoly, and you know, in Malaysia, even Indonesia, for the longest time, we've been talking about corruption, and this wouldn't happen without collusion from people with money and businesses. So how do you answer that question from Tansri and also from the grateful lady that I am for on that perspective, <clears throat> business? It's a good question. And I think the, the reason why uh, you mentioned pluralism is not a sexy song for many people is I think for many people, they don't feel the benefits of diversity. They don't feel the benefits of pluralism, and they don't feel the benefits of apparent economic growth of the region. Um, so I think it's important that um, as our region does well, and it is doing well economically, one of the most attractive economic regions globally, that more and more people feel the concrete benefits uh, and that the gains are shared with all of them whether it's economically, educationally, socially, politically. And I think if we can do that, I think diversity as a song will become more sexy. And I think to your question of what change needs to occur, I think I recognize that I think business has an important role to play. I think businesses today uh, must uh, realize that in addition to just providing new products and services to the consumer, I think uh, a, a, a bigger role is expected of them uh, to also take part and address some of the social problems that our region faces. And in many countries like Indonesia, where, where you know, with, with such large land masses uh, and such uh, inadequate infrastructure, sometimes business is best positioned to do that, and in fact, better positioned than governments to do that. So I think in that sense, businesses have a very important role to play. Uh, and I think if we can do that, we can contribute um, to making sure that the progress of ASEAN is felt by more people. And I think only by doing that can I think pluralism uh, continue to thrive. Cool. I'll take, you want to add on? Yes, mm -hmm. please. Uh, to the question or relate, uh, in relation to catalyst and the narrative of pluralism, I think she answered your question. What would be the catalyst is actually to promote pluralism? And that's something that is very important. The more you promote pluralism, the more it's going to become more standard and normal for people to be able to live together without any threat and without any fear 
of the other. And that's something that we believe strongly in the foundation that I found in Manusha Foundation. Because in our work, we are building people, we are bringing together people from very diverse sectors. And we are building coalitions and network of people living with HIV, LGBTI, religious minorities, refugees, migrants, indigenous people, who are very different, but are all sharing the same trend of discrimination and criminalization perpetrated by the government or by business, businesses. And when you bring those people together, they are sharing solidarity, they are learning from each other, and they are building understanding and compassion. And then they stand together with one strong voice showing that pluralism, by standing together, together, showing what they would like for the country, a diverse, united country that embrace diversity, that the, the not, the, does not push anyone to select a religion, but actually they can all live together within all their religions. They can be uh, from very different, different ethnicity and still they can all advocate together, stand as one strong voice to lobby the government to improve their, their livelihood and to pass positive legislation that would not criminalize them. So I think the solution, and it was an excellent question because she gave you the answer, promoting pluralism is the catalyst. I think I want to squeeze one last question. Can I add to that before? Sure. Okay. Um, totally agree with both. And, and I would like to add, uh, even though it sounds cheesy probably, but we need to build the, the sense of pride okay. being one nation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we used to have that, but not anymore, I think, John. Um, but just looking at Asian Games, the one we just had, okay. with, the, with the opening so cool and everywhere has become trending topic, suddenly, without inst being instructed, there is this sense of pride being Indonesian. And we have more gold medals than targeted. And, and for the two weeks time, nobody talks about being different. Nobody talks about um, where do you come from, ethnicity, religion, or political choices. Nobody talk about that. We just realize we become one one big nation and we're, we have the pride of being Indonesian. If we have these narratives um, to schools and, and universities where uh, the youth are showing tendency being xenophobic and intolerant, then the other narratives, uh, the one who wanna you know, become the, the, the warrior for their religion or certain ethnicity will, will definitely automatically reduced. yeah, reduced. Just adding to that. Imagine having an all-star sports team made up of ASEAN countries, all 10 of them. Just a thought. Final question, please, sir. Can we get the sound? Yes. No, no sound? No. Hello? Okay, now on. Um, my name is Robert. I'm, uh, while I'm Dutch, I've been in the region for 18 years, and um, I'm a technologist by heart. So um, my question focuses on how um, does technology help or hinder uh, pluralism uh, in, in ASEAN? Is any kind of technology? Any kind of technology. Mm. Businessman, take that first. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think technology creates a much more transparent. He's always picking on me. He's always picking on me. <laughs> because, because at the media center, they say that his company ferried two helicopters of media, so technology inclined. So. <laughs> I, I think technology creates a much more transparent um, marketplace of ideas. Mm -hmm. And that cuts both ways. Okay. It can be a negative factor because it obviously allows bad ideas and bad actors to, to, um, to use a more transparent marketplace ideas to convey their message. But I think at the very same time, it also allows good actors to take advantage and capitalize on that transparent marketplace idea of ideas to, uh, to promote their cause. So again, I return to the example of our uh, current president, Jokowi's uh, election as first governor of Jakarta and then president of Indonesia, uh, this was a man who uh, did not run uh, on a, uh, d was not backed by a large political party. He was a self-made man in that sense, okay. in, in political terms. And yet he was able to garner the support, garner the votes, garner the funding, precisely because of technology. And that would, I don't think would have been possible 15, 20 years ago. 
So I think t technology has democratized power in that sense. And if the good actors would like to actively use it, it can be a force of good. I think the problem is oftentimes the bad actors are more active in using that as a platform, whereas the good actors are more passive. Um, okay. So I think it is, it is, it is uh, upon us, it is our responsibility uh, to take a more active role and to shape uh, uh, and to make sure that our voices are heard uh, in, a, in a world of a much more transparent and efficient marketplace of ideas. I want to bridge that to Reverend Sugino because yes, we should be more active, don't blame others if we don't put positive messages, but if we open all the doors and windows in our house, who's going to be vigilant and stay up there to make sure no one enters, for example. And that's what people are accusing the platform economies, like the new technological platform, like social media for. The te technology and um, uh, social, social uh, media platform are important. But before that, sense of purpose. Okay. The, uh, it's important that uh, um, uh, this uh, catalyst uh, for uh, social cohesion, even in Rakhine State, in Myanmar, right now, uh, there are forces which uh, try to bring together Rohingyas and Arakan communities and other communities all together for dialogue. And they can use the technology to strengthen their work, but unless there is a very strong sense of purpose to create broader mm -hmm. identity, uh, technology can be misused. Okay. And history has shown us uh, how, his, uh, how technology has been misused. You look at Nazi Germany, Joseph Goebbels was so effective because he took control of the airwaves yeah. and he consolidated power over that. During the Marcos dictatorship, it was the same thing. The powers that be, the, the, the Marcos regime, took over the, the television, took over media. Okay. So they controlled technology and took it out of the hands of the people mm -hmm. so they, they no longer had any voice. What's exciting today, I think, is that now we all have access to, to this technology. It just seems like... Uh, the, 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 the dark side is more okay. better funded and, and more um, open to you misusing it. Mm -hmm. But there, there's tons of opportunities for the rest of us to learn how to use it for the good. So lessons learned from the Star Wars movie. Emily, you would like? Yes, so for me, technology is really important because it opens doors and, open, and it and allows the invisible and the unheard to be visible and be heard. But we also need to put things in perspective and to put things into context. We are in ASEAN and we are under military regimes. Okay. Thailand is under a military government. Laos is under dictatorship. Myanmar is, uh, although is uh, under civilian government since 2011, it's still military. And so we also need to realize that although people are trying to use technology, are trying to use technology to be able to share these stories and to be able to share the truth, especially when they are facing rights violation, when, they are be, when there is a crackdown on human rights defenders, they're also being arrested for using technology. You know, you have the case of human rights defenders in Thailand being arrested for liking, for pushing the button like, or for sharing news about the king. You have stories uh, in Laos where, where the government, due to the Lao Dem collapse, collapse, has reminded Lao people that they will be against the law if they share news or fake news, basically sharing the truth about how the Lao Dem has undermined their livelihoods. So as much as technology is a great tool to be able to share the truth and share stories, it's also being used by government trying to control it and control, trying to control the narrative and silence human rights defenders. Okay, Kamaro. Yes, yes. Technology is definitely important, but if we do not equip the people, it can be backfired. I take Indonesian case. Uh, our literacy rate is very low. In fact, we only better than Botswana. So can you imagine our traditional literacy rate is low? And there come the digital literacy rate. So um, we have a lot of youth in our uh, demography. And uh, with low education, uh, very low literacy rate, and they have the technology. So hope spreading rapidly. And um, yeah, this is something that we need to, to, to overcome. So technology, definitely, we need those. And PSI, uh, we heavily depend on technology to build uh, the party from, from the ground. But um, we really need to equip the people so they can be uh, critical uh, when uh, we, we have an access now to all information that we can get, just one touch through Google and stuff. But we, re we really need to, to filter the information that we get from the technology so that it won't backfire and threat pluralism. Mm -hmm. A youth on the streets once told me, Robert, 
that technology is like a fancy sports car that would be nice to have. But whether or not that's true, sadly, nobody has reinvented time. So that's all the time that we have. Please give a big round of applause to all my five panelists. And to yourself, very good crowd. So I want to steal the next one and a half minutes to just say my two favorite takeaway from here is that Wow, such optimism from my biggest neighbor, Indonesia. And uh, I want to link that point to the fact that Emily came all the way from Europe, chose to be in Southeast Asia, and she puts out the word invisible hypocrisy. And what I like the most is, thanks to the lady I owe coffee to, <laughs> that pluralism needs a champion narrative by artists, businessmen, reverends, you, the civil society and other stakeholders, and including myself. So, but the world is full of irony, and I would like to thank WEF or WEF. Mm -hmm. I want to end with this. I think it's app because in January, we had India opening and US closing. President Trump was at the end. So I would like to quote from Martin Luther King. An individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individual concern to the broader concerns of humanity. And Ibu dan juga Bapa, saya mau pinjam. Bineka Tunggal Ika, Unity in Diversity, Pancasila Indonesia, juga semangat di Malaysia, Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, Philippines, or wherever you are. ASEAN is going to move forward, but we need to address all the issues we have discussed. Thank you so much, and we'll catch you. Hopefully, we've done well, and you give us two hours in Davos in January. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you so much.